All right. Uh, good evening. Thank you for everybody for being here. Um, uh, for those, uh, if you haven't already, uh, well, I'm, I'm mainly at the moment talking to the trail. If you haven't already done the survey, please do that in the link I sent. Um, Mr. Johnson, uh, if uh, he afforded the survey to you, you feel free to give us input on what uh, would make you consider uh, being a member of such an organization. Uh, but welcome to the July uh, meeting of the uh, Capital uh, Florida chapter of SGMP. Uh, we have a great speaker here with us tonight. Uh, this is being recorded so it can be shared with others. Oh, and there is uh, Dr. Moran. Uh, I was just going to make an attempt at uh, an introduction based off of the information I had, but you know him far better. So I will turn that over to you to let you introduce him. Wow, um, outstanding. Um, I don't have my information in front of me. That's the that's the problem with, uh, did everyone share uh, what's going on with me? Let me do that right quick. And uh, I'll tell you why I don't have this information in front of me, but I can get it uh, fairly quickly. Uh, my entire office is uh, 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 more than 50% of the people have tested positive with, with COVID. They uh, shut down the office uh, very recently, as in right now, and the entire office will be uh, sprayed down uh, on tomorrow. And so uh, that's why I'm ill-prepared. Usually I am not, but uh, that's uh, what's going on with me. Um, and so uh, let me uh, 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 pull up uh, um, uh, Mr. Uh, uh, um, my brother, Chester. <laughs> 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 right now. I'm, I'm, you are I'm forgetting, I'm forgetting <laughs> names. <and> it's probably <laughs> just a COVID symptom. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Um, you did test positive? Uh, my my home test said negative, but we have okay. to do a PCR uh, yeah. to be absolutely sure. We have too many folks that are, that are out that have tested positive that I will say I was in close contact okay. with because we were all together moving and assembling things. And, and uh, when I say in close proximity, we're crossing over one another and, and, and things like that. So uh, on my wing, there's about eight of us. So we know that four of the eight uh, are, are positive. And so, uh, and the rest of us, uh, uh, um, they've already shut down the COVID centers. Uh, even uh, the CVS, they don't have any appointments today uh, at all. So that's why I'm late. I was driving just about every CVS in Tallahassee, Walgreens, and I was going on the internet at the same time at the traffic you light. You tried to get a test? I tried to get a, a PCR, but you have to make appointment for drive through Right. That's well, FAMU, um, FAMU has them, though. They're closed. They closed early because of the bad weather. Whenever there's oh, lightning, oh, no, there's okay. thunder, and the yeah. weather is bad now, uh, you, you and found so a CVS? say again. You did find a CVS? No. <clears throat> oh uh, yeah. There absolutely is okay, not so listen, one. Listen, after the yeah, they definitely have them. Uh, yeah, they do them. have them. That was I only went to them because of uh, uh, because I could not uh, because FAMU was closed. That okay. was the reason why. Um, I tried uh, CVS, um, um, and so I tell you what, uh, I'm going to go to uh, our site <laughs> and pull up his information. Um, um, you could right also there. just share, um, he was saying yeah, really, share great things, uh, really great things about you before yeah. you came on, so you, it'd be nice to give us a little history as well. Okay, let's 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 just do that. I, I've had a pleasure of meeting this uh, this young man uh, a number of years ago. I'd say in the uh, late eighties, uh, early nineties. Thirty-two. A couple of say again. <laughs> Thirty-two to be exact. <laughs> <laughs> years ago, and uh, along with two other great gentlemen, <clears throat> uh, good friends of ours, and we had become, uh, uh, I believe, more than brothers, if you will, because we continue to uh, reach out to one another uh, on a weekly basis. And thank you to uh, Chester. He always uh, send us uh, uh, motivational uh, messages every morning and uh, definitely appreciate it about that. Uh, he has been uh, 
uh, more like a, uh, a big brother than a little brother. And that's always beautiful because uh, we live vicariously through him because he's done a lot of great things. And what I love about this young man because of uh, all the successes that he, he have had, he never ever uh, placed himself uh, uh, on a pedestal above uh, those of us that are uh, just uh, the average everyday <laughs> guys. And so he's definitely had um, successful in the area of uh, um, uh, entertainment. That's when I actually met him when uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the music group that he was a part of, Mare, uh, Unit 4, uh, that I was a part of, or working with Unit 4. And I was a, uh, a performer as well, traveling with these two groups. Uh, I wasn't uh, uh, as, uh, <laughs> I'd say, as entertaining as the two of those guys were. were but uh, I definitely you know, rode on their, their coattails in the area of uh, entertainment and followed them throughout the years. And we traveled uh, many different states, Washington, DC, and, and yes. performed in many different places. We even did in the earlier years what we call the Chitlin Circuit. We, yep. we performed in, in bars and, and civic centers and things. Uh, but they, uh, Chester uh, and his group and our, our friends took it to another level uh, to the point that he was recognized by Najee and a lot of other great performers that uh, uh, soaked up their, their talent and intelligence even to work with them. Uh, you've seen uh, his roster of uh, folks that he's been working with, uh, both in the sports arena and boxing, as well as the areas of entertainment. So he, uh, uh, as well as his, his partner, who is a, is a billionaire even today that we, we saw listed in, um, in, in the bio on the site. Uh, so he's a very, very humble uh, young man, uh, but uh, an amazing uh, young man that is too. He is a, a person that, um, that loves life, that, that loves the Lord, that loves people. And uh, if anyone, um, uh, I'd say that we have, him and I have a, uh, a um, uh, umbilical cord connection both spiritually and seem like we share the, the same DNA. Oftentimes when I think about uh, him and Ronnie Mackey and a great friend of mine that we call uh, Breeze, it, 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 uh, I might have to take a moment because it always, uh, almost brings me to tears when I think about the relationship that I have with them. And so, I'm always honored to be uh, uh, in their presence because uh, they're great guys. I love them. And uh, I'm always here to learn from them. And, uh, and I thank you for taking the time out to spend it uh, with us. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm so sorry. But um, uh, Chester Johnson. Well, the, that the pleasure and the honor is all mine. I can echo those sentiments back to James Moran a thousand times over with a thousand different tongues. I, I look up to him. He's a mentor of mine. He's a big brother. He's a friend. He's a confidant. He's, <clears throat> you know, whatever thousands of adjectives I could come up with. Um, I, I say that to him, I love him dearly. He's truly like my, my brother as if we came from the same womb. Um, the other uh, gentleman that he mentioned, Breeze, uh, which I know is some of the source of uh, Moran's um, tears right now is, um, was my cousin and my best friend as well. And he's, he has since gone on to uh, be with the Lord. He left us in 2005, but we were extremely, extremely close. And um, and uh, Breeze, Breeze and myself, you know, we had the pleasure of being taken in <clears throat> by James Moran, and, and um, he just um, he he just gave us um, just ubiquitous love across the board from the moment that we met until today. I'm honored to call him my brother, and my friend, and um, you know we, we would use up the time on this Zoom with me just saying as much good as I could about him. So 
Um, he's been in my home. He's had dinner with my family, you know, my father and mother, and um, you know, who are both going on as well. And <clears throat> we just, you know, I mean, th this is my guy. We 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 go to the movies together and, and share the same popcorn bucket. I mean, that's that's this is my brother in every essence of the word. So I love you, bro, and I thank you for inviting me here. And um, I'm always willing to do whatever you need me to do what's called upon. So it is indeed my pleasure. I, I'm, I'm honored, you know, so thank you so much. I apologize, guys. Uh, I'm, I'm usually <laughs> that straight lace guy. <laughs> but uh, I, I thank you, uh, 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 Chester, for spending time with you, ladies and gentlemen, you. With, you know, without further ado. <sighs> thank you so much. <clears throat> They've never seen this out of me. <laughs> Listen, no need for apologies. You can tell the the love is there and the brotherhood is there, and and uh, it's really refreshing to see it. It's really awesome to see it. So, yeah, Moran, you got me. So <laughs> I'm, you. Like, I'm crying with I you. you. <laughs> I love you guys. Thank you. So if you will uh, go ahead, uh, Chester, if you will talk about those experiences uh, as well as uh, what brought you into to music, if you will, uh, and the challenges that you've seen in the area of uh, entertainment and music negotiations uh, uh, in regards to a contract. Sure. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm a keyboard player and uh, musician but by, by trade, I, by birth. Um, I don't formally read, but it was a gift that God gave me. And I recognized, I guess by the time I was seven, I, I knew um, watching the, the Jackson Five and oddly enough, fast forward to today, Marlon Jackson is actually one of my colleagues and business partners now. And it's just sometimes it's surreal because I used to have the brothers plastered to my wall as a kid. But, <laughs> but um, when I saw the Jacksons and new edition and people like that, I, I knew immediately this is what I want to do was be in the music industry. So um, started taking it seriously with my uh, my, my cousin Breeze, his name was Kiefer Cotton, rest in peace. Around the early 80s, um, we started to try to figure out, you know, where we want to go with music, what we want to do with it. And by 1985, <clears throat> recognized by a gentleman by the name of Frederick Knight. And uh, Frederick Knight is um, famous for writing and producing a song that came out in the 70s called Ring My Bell by Anita Ward. And um, so he signed us and he was our first manager and producer. So by 1986, when I'm 13, 14 years old, I'm actually sitting in the studio being mentored by Eddie Kendrick of the legendary Temptations. And um, so, you know, the music industry uh, has been peaks and valleys, for sure. You name it, um, I've, I've done it from, from ha having success in it to sleeping in cars um, to um, knocking on doors at office buildings in New York and, um, and going out to California just on the home to see if we can meet certain people. I remember camping out from the Arsenio Hall show, hoping to catch a glimpse of Arsenio and just when his show was at the apex of its fame. So, you know, um, I, to dial it back, to go back to Eddie Kendrick of The Temptation, that's really where I started kind of honing in, even as a, as, as a child, adolescence, learning how to start learning some of the terminology and jargon uh, of the music lingo, some of the things to look out for, listening to some of the stories that the Temps had been through. So I really uh, cut my teeth early on that um, the entertainment side is definitely the optical glamour of it all, but it is truly a business. I mean, and if you lose sight of that, you know, you have a lot of the horror stories that you hear of people in the music industry just because um, I think they lose sight of um, the fact that it is a business, hence show business. And um, I, I think a lot of people concentrate more on the show and they can try to drift away from the fact that the business of music is a very real business. And if you're not student savvy enough to know exactly 
what you're doing to have the right people in your corner. Um, it can, um, you know, it can make your dream get a little bit damper. So we tried to make sure that we had a balance of the two and um, it, we didn't always get it right, but um, <clears throat> it afforded me along the way lessons to be learned through experiences and um, and meeting a lot of people. And, and hence, henceforth, I started to develop a lot of relational uh, relationships and, and, and started um, gaining the trust of business. What I, what I always wanted to do was go by the principle of uh, you um, always treat others the way you want to be treated. And I never wanted to have anyone in the business having heat for me. And to this day, unless it's something unbeknownst to me, you know, I don't think anyone is, has heat for me or checking for me in a negative way. I've always tried to leave every situation that I've been in on some sort of positive note. And, um, and it, it, with the myriad of experiences that I've had in the music and entertainment business, working at some film things, I consult now, I've done management, um, you name it. I've always tried to make sure that from a personal and a relational aspect that I kept uh, um, things on a level of of um, some sort of um, um, what's the best way I could put it? Just a, just a just a foundation of authenticity and to make sure that um, I could always be able to zero and circle back around to these individuals. There comes a time that I need their assistance or their help or um, whatever it is that they needed me to do. Did you? Uh, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> hire an attorney when you first uh, decided to get started? Uh, what was, uh, who was uh, seated beside you to, to make the decisions? Was it family? Was it a, a legal attorney? When it came to the point of looking at that contract and what it really meant uh, to you as a, young, as a young person with the potential to, uh, to move higher into entertainment? Good question. So it's a lot of different revelations on that. So <clears throat> let me take this one. So at the genesis of the group, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you be, being a teen, you know, and, and 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 we were all young men and teenagers. I don't think anyone was even 20 years old in my group. So, you know, we're talking 85, 86. Uh, to answer your question, uh, Mo, no, we we um we really we were winging it a lot of the times, and then uh, we we would uh, go to attorneys who didn't really specialize in the music field. But we would go to whatever, you know, if we saw a lawyer or an attorney, we just said that that um that point thought that, you know, ubiquitous across the board, that that meant that they knew everything and could do anything, you know, whether that's music or whatever the specialty would call for. So we had to learn our lessons in that department to understand that you actually have to have a good entertainment attorney that can guide you and 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 really understand the nuances that you may not be familiar with in, in uh in the entertainment industry and the music field that you would just take for granted, you know, in, in, in everyday walk of life or in other business platforms or paradigms. So we started off um, with an attorney by the name of Ron Story. He was actually a defense attorney. But, you know, what he did was he always let us know what he didn't know. And he was a, and he was a very, very uh, honest and credible person because there was a lot of times he could have taken money and just kind of said anything to us and he was like you know I guess he recognized these guys are young so a lot of times he did it pro bono and he would tell us as far as he could go or as far as he knew he could get to the ledge with the knowledge that he had at the time until he recommended that guys you know you need to really start seeking out a great entertainment attorney and from our small hometown in Alabama you know that at the time you know there, there was no entertainment attorneys closest that you would get would be Atlanta so uh, we had to actually pool resources and get in the car and travel over there and start looking for people so to answer your question I'm sorry but this is soliloquy but no we didn't have um an entertainment attorney at first and then we kind of paid the price a little bit in our first contract because we kind of just signed out of the excitement of it all without actually really, really knowing um, uh, all of the uh, the details and the and the uh, just the levels of um, of different aspects of the business that you definitely need to know before you put your handcock on a on a on a, on a contract. One thing I remember uh, seeing 
uh, you do. There was a, a book that I always stays in my mind. It was called the the Business of Entertainment, a book that you you had like your Bible uh, seated uh, next to you, uh, learning and and reading and uh, soaking that that book up because you you knew that it, that you 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 had to understand the the lingo, the nuances uh, uh, of that particular business, uh, so that you know uh, you would not uh, moving forward as you did. Uh, Right. Understand what uh, was was been talked about and and what it looked like when it came to uh, 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 entertainment negotiations. The business of music is it's more than just uh, 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 writing lyrics or, or playing an, an instrument. Uh, that's a, exciting things, you know, all by itself. Uh, and then you dove into that particular book, and by reading that book and that experience. Uh, you then leapt into uh, to other things, and and uh, and then now to your credit, you mentioned just a few names. What are some of those other names? And and talk to to us about uh, what you learned from that particular book, uh, and what are your your keys to uh, success at this particular point? Because a lot of folks are now reaching out for uh, to work with Chester Johnson. Well, first of all, I, I'm, I'm really <laughs> thrilled at your memory of that because <laughs> I've kind of forgotten all about that. It's amazing you remember that. You know, um, yeah, I um, that was a book that was a staple for me. Um, uh, every, everything that you need to know about the music business. Um, it was written by Kashif, actually one of my um, favorite keyboard players. He was a great influence on me as well as Jimmy Jam. From Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, actually my idol. And um, so, yeah, through that, I started learning about the dynamics of publishing, um, mechanical royalties that, you know, I didn't even know, you know, just from our first contract that we signed because our producer didn't tell us. And I'm, and I'm not trying to discredit him in any form or shape, you know, he's a legendary producer, but, you know, he didn't volunteer that, you know, you make money from your song being played on the radio if it's a hit. You know, and uh, you get X amount of, you know, um, amounts per per minute, you know, if it's three, four minute song. So, you know, all of these things I didn't know. I was playing in the elevator in a hotel. So we didn't know that there was a, a tabulation of all of those different things that you actually could get remunerations from. And um, so um, we, we learned that and I learned that through reading these books and learning, you know, publishing and, and um, you know, production deals, you know, a lot of times uh, there were label deals directly, um, like, you know, you may sign directly to Motown, but then again, you may sign a production deal as LaFace La Records was with Arista, and, um, and <clears throat> for, that's a totally, totally different dynamic as opposed to if you're signed, you know, directly to the, uh, the nucleus, which is the label itself, so it, you know, it was um, um, a, a lot of different dynamics that we had to, to learn from that. And, and uh, so that book, uh, Moran, definitely taught me a lot of things that, unfortunately, you know, there's a lot of elder statesmen, so to speak, that a lot of people in this business that really won't let you know exactly all of the, uh, the jargon, the terminology, all, all the things that are available to you because you know, it, it's a rough business. It's a hard business, and and um, and, and anything that is a uh, capital driven, a lot of times people are more concerned with the capital than the people. And uh, and I always felt like people are capital that you invest in, and who they are as personalities and as spirits, and and that would always yield a great result going down the line. So, and what was the thing you mentioned? I'm sorry about. Some of the people I work with, Maria. I'm sorry, I was just sitting there chatting and I was on mute. <laughs> what? And the other thing that I, I, I was going to ask was, um, you know, once you then get in, got into the, the entertainment business, and you 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 knew that you were moving forward, and and then there were people that were assigned to you to uh, then shop for you and and uh, the buy you the jewelry and, and, and the wardrobe and you have this little trailer and you're just figuring out that 
that, wow, the company is really taking care of me. But mm -hmm. in essence, what they're doing is uh, uh, um, uh, they're billing me, you know, at some point exactly. down the line is that eventually I have to pay for everything that is uh, that I'm consuming. Talk to me about that. Well, absolutely. I mean, essentially, when you get a record deal, you know, you have to not be um, um, uh, food in, in, in any uncertain terms that it is a loan. I mean, they are giving you a loan. They will definitely pamper you from a materialistic standpoint, but it's it's all it's all borrowed until it's time to recoup. And what they do, especially if you're signed to a multiple album deals, then you get advanced money. And if, if unfortunately, if you're in the red and not in the black, off the sales of the first one, they will advance you again. But it's a repeated revolving door in a cycle of keeping you kind of in that debt. Now, I come from a music industry time where, you know, basically you, you didn't really make money too much off your record sales. It's kind of sort of like that to this day, even though we have different portals, which is the streaming platforms and so forth and so on, because physical goods are pretty much non-existent or they're very, very limited. But, um, you know, I was still dealing with uh, vinyl and, and, and um, cassettes and CDs at the time I was signed. So a lot of the a lot of the um, profits that came from the physical sales actually went to the record company for your advances. You know, so the bulk of the money that was made, and it's still true to this day in some degree, was from performances and merchandising. Now they've kind of shifted that paradigm to where they have these 360 deals now. And 360 deals, um, the, the the label now will get an ownership piece of pretty much everything that you're doing. So you're touring, um, you're merchandising. And, you know, if you happen to have some real estate that you know uh, that that Grandma Sally had in, in West Montana somewhere, they're gonna find a way to make sure the they they being the label that um, it's going to be financially applicable to them, and they're gonna make sure that um that you understand that, yeah, we'll, we'll buy you that, that Mercedes and we'll get you that Rolex for you. But all of that stuff essentially is on loan until we do our recruitments. And that recruitment is going to come in the form of sales. It's going to come in the form of publishing. It's going to come in the form of merchandising. It's going to come in the form of uh, touring. And um, these are, these are the ways until, you know, that debt is cleared up with the, record labels that you are continually in, in that cycle. Now, if you notice, um, there are ex explosive artists. And what I mean by that, you know, you can, you can count a handful of them. It's thousands and thousands of artists and it's thousands of, of uh, uh, material and content being re released. But if you ever really notice, you can count the superstars essentially on one hand. So, the Jay Z's, the Beyonce's, the you know, <clears throat> there there are a few that um that break through the Rihanna's where uh, the record label will appropriate funding into um, the promotion of those artists, even though they may have fifty or hundred artists signed to the label, but whoever starts to um, that seed that starts to germinate and grow into a a real big hit is where they'll put the bulk of the funds. And um, with that being said, only if you take radio, for example, only 32 songs can really be on the playlist successfully. And out of those 32, you may have five that are monster hits. So with that being said, uh, the, the, the ratio and the, the checks and balances of, of the success rates is, um, is few and far between. So you, um, my, my favorite producer, Jimmy Jam, said something one time. He was in an interview and he said, um, and, I, and I, I subscribe to this notion of thought. He said that uh, a journalist asked him one time, um, you, hey, you know, you guys are, are the hottest producers out there. How does it feel to be hot? And he said, um, well, we don't really want to be hot. We just want to be warm for a long time. So, you know, there are situations where can be warm for a long time. You may not be those explosive 
Janet or Michael Jackson hits or Prince hits or, or Drake or whatever the case may be. But you have those albums that come out with those artists consistently do quite well across the board. Luther Vandross was the name that comes to mind where it wasn't really a five or 10 million album seller, but to do a 500,000 to a million platinum pretty much every time consistently, every time he came out, labels like artists like that because that does get the bills paid. And, um, and, and, and you have a consistent fan base of the market share that you can kind of tap into that you can call the reliables where you know that they're gonna go out and purchase the material. So uh, that's, that's that pretty much um, was some of the things that I witnessed with even some of the artists that I work with, you know, um, over the years. Now you um, then flip from the, the, uh, the music industry per se, mm -hmm. uh, but not, you know, completely. Uh, and then you moved into some uh, aspects of uh, of management, what was the what was the shift, or was it just the same taste, the same flavor, the same kind of movement? But what what do you 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 see as um, what directed you to now uh, get into business management uh, opposed to? And I know that you're probably doing some of both. I believe based on you know, what you shared with me, uh, but what do you see? Um, uh, as that uh, golden nugget as a business manager, uh, opposed to just uh, music entertainment. And both may be golden man uh, nuggets, I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. No. Um, well, you know, um, interestingly, with you mentioning that, um, you know, the, the truest revelation I can make on this phone is that, you know, my group was not ever really enormously successful to the points of the um, new editions of the Boys to Men or the, you know, those groups that actually had an opportunity to really have these volcanic erupted type careers. But what, but what it did afford was the opportunity for um, me to develop a lot of relationships through the portal of music. <clears throat> and, and to answer your question, uh, Moran, I really just started feeling a calling, you know, like a, an unction to start moving toward that way. Or people would come to me and say, hey, you know, can you do this for me? Or would you do that for me? It's just like, um, just to fast forward to, um, I was manager of, uh, Evander Holyfield, and, and, and let me explain boxing because it's like how you go from music to boxing. I actually was uh, producing um, music and entrance music for Roy Jones Jr., who I'm actually um, a senior advisor to now. And I actually wrote the theme song that Holyfield walked out to in his first fight with Mike Tyson in 96. So he used a song that uh, we produced and performed as his entrance music. And I've, I've done a little boxing myself over the years. I'm not very good. I just do this train. <laughs> and I've always loved the sport, you know. And so I gravitated toward the boxing field in a major way because it is my favorite sport. And, 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 and through music is, is how I started ma making these relationships with boxers. And um, and Evander Holyfield, actually, going back to what I was saying about people coming and ask you to assist um, Moran, he actually asked me to come on as, as his manager. So I became his manager by default because we were just good friends for such a long period of time. I, um, I have this funny story about meeting him. I was actually in college at FAMU, watching him win the... Uh, his first heavyweight title against Buster Douglas in October of 1990. I never forget it. I was on my apartment was on Stucky Avenue off Lake Bradford, and uh, <laughs> and I was over there with some college buddies, and and I made this proclamation that night. And I said, "Hey, you know, one day I said that's gonna be my friend. He's gonna be my buddy, and you know, we're gonna hang out together. And, you know, I'm just talking off the cuff. We're gonna hang out and work out together." And they all laughed at me. And it just made, so it gave me like this determined fire to almost like I'm going to show them that I'm going to uh, make that a reality. So, and that's when I really started tapping into actually what you speak and what you say, if you really believe it, start moving toward that direction, you can make that stuff happen, you know? 
and then God makes it happen for you through just really believing it and, and decreeing it. And <clears throat> so therefore, four years later, you know, I was friends with Evander Holyfield. So long story how that process took place. But we were friends and uh, it's, you know, it's 20 years this year that I've known him. And I managed him for um, two and a half years only, you know, but we've done different type of businesses together, started a record label in the late nineties. And, um, but he asked me to come on and assist and become a manager. And, and um, my tenure with him ended two years ago where I started a consulting firm and I started working with a voluminous amount of different people in the entertainment industry. But um, yeah, I just felt a call in Maria and, uh, to go in a different direction. And I started really falling in love more so with the business of it. I, I've always been the type of person that, you know, show me how the car is built as opposed to just allow me to get the key, put it in ignition, put it in drive and, and go. You know, that's that's like the that's the that's the glamorous, that's the pretty part of it all. But like show me like all the mechanisms that it takes to get there. And I was always more fascinated with that. Even when I was in the music industry, I was more fascinated with, you know, the behind the scenes and how does all of that work as opposed to be, being out front. I never ever really was ever in love with being a front guy in any regard, you know. Um, just kind of my, you know, Moran can tell you my personalities by nature is more laid back. I'm just, um, you know, I don't really want to be too noticeable if, if necessary. I just want to be a serviceman and, you know, blue collar and put on the, put on the hard hat and, and, and put the work in. So, um, so, but my relationships through the music industry afforded me the opportunity to pivot. And as I pivot, these type of relationships just started kind of coming into play and, and then put me in, in the route that I'm on now, which is consulting to a lot of different actors and actresses and athletes in the entertainment industry to this day in sports world. I don't want to take over all the questions, but if, if there are others, I will, I will yield. <laughs> I have a question. So uh, we were going to be talking about negotiation. I'd love to hear how has negotiation changed through the years? Because you've been involved for a number of years in negotiation, contract negotiations. How have things changed um, from your perspective? Well, I, you know, that, that's a great question. How have things changed? I think to, to me, as far as changing, you, you know, negotiations are kind of like, um, it can kind of a little bit, be like the, you know the flavor of ice cream is it's, it's what you prefer so what I try to do is I try to tailor everything based on the particular client that I'm working with and what and, and what I know their needs are or their likes or their you know their um, uh, proclivities for certain things you know to take place and then and what I try to do I try to tailor the way I, I um, um, you know procure do deal procurements and things of that nature based on a lot of stuff that is personality driven with them. Um, I, I understood um, to take my um, management uh, time with Evander Holyfield. Um, I, I knew his personality. I, you know, I knew when he was zoning you out. I knew when he was turn, you know, turn, tuned into things. So when I was sitting down with a uh, particular brand or if there was uh, appearances or, or movie situations or whatever it was on the table, I could tailor it based on what I knew was going to give him the greatest shield, based on um, um, his 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 ability to 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 perform and, and what his his taste buds, so to speak, um, uh, you know, what what his palate kind of preferred. So I've I've never I've, I've never tried to to answer your question to go into a negotiation process. With, in any type of strong arm way. I've always tried to meet people at a level of how I would want to be received. So I've always tried to come in harmonious with um, an, an ability to be able to listen, to, to negotiate, to know that I don't know everything. So I say, well, you know, let's articulate all of the uh, pieces of this puzzle to make sure that we can figure out a way that we can put it together to make the, that perfect picture that we want on the front of the puzzle box. But I understand that, that uh, every time that you're doing it with, per whoever the client is, it's always a little bit different. 
Um, nowadays, um, I've, I've, I've definitely experienced a little bit more aggression in, in negotiations in the past that as a as preferred to now. Um, thing, things have, and, and maybe that's just because I'm getting older and I've, I've done it a little bit longer. So therefore, there are nuances and there are ways to um, pretty much, um, I think, yield the result that I'm looking for. Basic, and then it, it, it is based on the personality of the person you're negotiating with, too. You know, it's, it's who, whoever that is, or that brand, or that label, or whatever the case may be, their their demeanor and their you know their their idiosyncrasies, or whatever the case may be, plays a lot into how uh, the exit strategy of the deal is going to look. So. Um, that's an interesting question. You know what I'm saying? I don't think it's one satisfactory answer in that one, but, um, you know, negotiating now for, for me, from the experiences I've had is a deal by deal basis based on the client and who I'm dealing with. Latreo, uh, anyone else? Steven? Um, I just thought it was interesting that you were able to transition from music to managing someone in the sports industry. Is there a difference or is there not a difference? And that's why it was such an easy transition to go from one to the other. Uh, good question. Um, you, you know, yes, it, it, it was a big difference in the respect. And I'm not saying it's, it's a, it was a bad difference, but it was a big difference in the respect that when I was an artist, all of that was done for me because I had a manager. I didn't really have to work. You know, I would always listen and, and try to ask questions to the people that we had representing us, but it was really no need for me to dive, you know, all the way into those waters because, you know, you had people that were doing that for you. Um, uh, along with trying to arm myself and be a sponge to, to soak up as much knowledge as I could. Um, for, for me, let me back up a little bit. Going back to my cousin Breeze, um, Kiefer Cotton, we started off as, as, um, as concert promoters and throwing parties when I was 14 years old. So there was, <laughs> so there was always a little bit of a business to our structure, you know, even way back then. So even when we got signed and, and had managers and role managers, and all of these people that were working for us at being artist, we had a little bit of uh, background by default just by, you know, um, doing the work early, early in life. And, and um, so to revisit it, yeah, it was a difference because now people were dependent on me to do those things that I was dependent on others to do for me. So, but I, I, I loved it, you know, like one of the greatest things besides my uh, faith in God and just in my children is just um, waking up in the morning with a task at hand, you know, looking to close a deal and just the excitement of saying, okay, we're at A and I'm trying to get to Z by the end of the day if I can. And all that happens in between, uh, just the excitement of um, bringing it to a close, you know. So I found joy in that. And that's when I knew that I, I was called to do this. Like I started getting a greater joy out of um, the business side of it, negotiating a deal and sitting across from uh, you know people that I never thought that I would ever even be in the room with. When I started to get a better joy doing that than I was as a performer, that's when I knew that God was pointing me in a different direction. So it, it was different to answer your question. It definitely was different than, than, than being an artist and being a performer. But it was a it was a welcome difference that uh, I enjoyed, and um, and one of my uh, partners to this day, Jeff Hoffman, who actually apologized, he wanted to be on this Zoom tonight. He's at, he actually had to suddenly travel out of the country. He's the co-founder of Priceline.com. You know, he mentored me in uh, in telling me things like he would drop these jewels, like, okay, you have to imagine yourself at the top of the mountain. So go ahead and imagine yourself there and put your white flag there. You, you're already victorious. Now what you have to do is just find the, the portals the, and the particles and the journey and the experience along the way getting there and learn how to enjoy it. 
that was always fascinating to me when he would say that. Because I'm like, you know, I never thought about it like, okay, already imagine yourself at the top of the mountain. Usually we're thinking from the bottom up, you know, what is it going to take, you know, for me to get the right type of rope and the right type of gear to get myself prepared to get on top of this mountain? He's like, no, 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 you're already at the top of the mountain. Then you start thinking about the process on how to get there. And it changed my whole perspective, even in how I approached deal making of any kind. So, um, so yeah, I just love it. I'm, I'm fascinated with the, uh, the entire world of entertainment on every level, you know, and, um, you know, Moran and I would have talks and write songs and do things together. And it's just, you know, on every level I've, I've been taught. So I try to gain something from every experience I've been through and taking it to what I'm doing now. If I'm in a boardroom or if I'm in someone's car and we're just listening to, uh, you know, something new that they're put, getting ready to put out, all of it just framed in my um, interpretation of how I see this business and I try to take something from it every day to push myself forward to get better. Steven, I see you bursting. Well, no, I was curious on uh, what your thoughts or experience are or have, maybe you have or haven't, um, uh, on more that single contract for like a specific event. Because um, many of us have, well, I've seen some where it's like, okay, we're having this speaker or singer entertainer whatever it is and they have to have this precise bottle of water uh they have to have this exact uh you know bar you know they have to have a bowl of skittles and they all have to be green you know or you know we've heard the the stories of how like you know aretha franklin you can't have air conditioning in the building for 24 hours before she sings just you know your thoughts or experience with some of those conditions where some of them are you know, maybe they're legitimate that, you know, people have preferences, allergies, you know, that sort of thing. Right. Other times it's like, that's just a way to maybe help them get out of a contract that they want to back out. Just want your thoughts or input on that. That's interesting, Stephen, that you put it that way about contract to want to back out. <laughs> this is what I found, especially about artist writers. Really, here's a Here's some of the answer in a nutshell. It's not an exact science, but a lot of that stuff is just ego driven. They just put that in, like, and the reason I can say this with absolute certitude is that I've talked to artists that said that, said, man, you know, where, you know, they, we, we, we get 15 chicken breasts and, you know, and it has to be this type of spice on it. He said, man, we just do that just because we can do it. <laughs> And, and, and that's kind of unfortunate to a degree because they know that people uh, want their services and want to be around them and want to see them and want to hire them for the event because they love them so much. And a lot of that stuff is just, um, it's ego driven. Now, with that being said, there, there are um, some situations where, you know, a, a singer may have to have room temperature water as, a, as opposed to cold water and may affect their vocals or, they have to stay away from this type of dairy, of course, and uh, across the board because it's going to, you know, affect their nostrils or their nasal cavity or wh whatever the case may be. But, um, and, and you know what? And I never really thought about it in the way that you said it just then, Stephen, about backing out the contract. It, you know, but that that's that's a good observation because I think some of that probably could be uh, applicable to, to, to some people saying, well, you know, if I throw enough um, silly season type stuff at them, <laughs> then maybe they may decide to just kind of take a pass because uh, either um, they don't want to do it or commit to the date or maybe there are some, some who, who, who knows some, some nuanced reasons why they don't want to participate. But a lot of it I've just found to just be because they, they just feel they can. Crazy, right? <laughs> It's, it's definitely interesting that you said that, uh, Stephen. I uh, had uh, had, uh, had a speaker that was coming to the College of Pharmacy's uh, 65th anniversary. I won't say his name. I won't throw him under the bus. <clears throat> but he had uh, signed the contract and he said that he was coming. But uh, and then he found out that there was uh, there was a, a political event that he would uh, rather. Uh, participate at or or get a bigger bang for his buck, uh, if you will. And he uh, decided that uh, he, he called us and says that his 
his grandmother was doing, was being ill. Uh, and we looked at the contract and the only way that he'd be able to get out of that contract was some, some emergency or some family uh, issues, if you will. But <clears throat> the interesting thing about that was I had a friend of mine who was at that political event who uh, sent me a photo of him um, at this particular event. Of course, his grandmother was ill, yet he uh, was able to, to uh, participate at this other event, uh, get paid uh, higher dollars, uh, uh, if you will. But he had already had a contract with us, but he read the fine print. Uh, I found out ab about that because of the photo, shared that with his uh, booking agency, and then they had no other choice but to refund us uh, those dollars. And, uh, and I see him on television from time to time, and I feel some kind of way about him and, and, uh, and that particular uh, contract that he tried to get himself uh, out of because he wanted to have more fun with another group. It's, it's sad because we had, uh, we had built uh, the, uh, uh, the event on his name. And, and, and sold out and everything. So long story short, we had to uh, end up, you know, contracting someone else uh, 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 last minute. Uh, it went extremely well, but uh, right now he's a pie in the eye. Yeah. I, I, know, I know situations like that. I know what you mean. My only two experiences related to airplanes. Um, one, it was a very loose contract, uh, so there were options for both of us to get out, but this entertainer uh, lived in Canada and found out they were going to have to take more than two connecting flights to get to Tallahassee, and they backed out, and we were a little disappointed. We explained you knew where we were before you did all this. Right. Um, the other um, was... Um, a, a different work event and the and they were trying to press very hard on first class airfare well they came in said first class <clears throat> we sent back coach they wrote back and, and we went back and forth a time or two and we had explained look up the Tallahassee airport there is no first class service coming in this was 15 years ago I'm like you look at the plane there is no first class seat of any you know significance not like the type they're talking uh, you know, they were wanting the nice luxury experience. And it's like, you've got to look at the plane that's coming in here. We can't help that. I mean, they ended up accepting it, but they thought we were trying to play hardball. And it's just like, no, from where you're coming, there is no plane. There's a little Delta jet. If you go another route, that's got a seat that's about three inches bigger, <laughs> but it's not true first class. Yeah. 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 And, 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 you know, the unfortunate uh, part about that and just thinking about with this entertainment industry, we know that the optics are meant to be a certain way. It's like, here's the entertainer and, and here's, the, here's the consumer and here's the fan. And, and they know that. So because that, they'll push to try to get um, this, this quote unquote royal treatment to see exactly how much they can pull out of you in the negotiations that, um, that, that you'll succumb to and just, you know, and bow down to to their wants, it's not really a need at all, but it's it, it's just, um, it, it's, it's, it's part of the vortex of this business and, and the way that um, people wanna look or how they wanna appear or whatever the case may be. And sometimes they would just make deal breakers like that, Stephen, just simply off ego. I mean, you know, if we go back to what the, uh, the crux of it is, the nucleus of it is, is that a lot of it is just in superficial filings of, of, of you know egotist, egotism just you know and uh, I've always tried to just um, no matter who I've met or who I've been around or who I've uh, uh, had the opportunity to you know enjoy time with you know in, in this business over 36 years this year so at the time I've been in around in the entertainment industry in some form or fashion Treat others like you want to be treated. It's, it's a really simple situation. And I, uh, you know, I don't ask for any more. And another thing I, <clears throat> I used to do too, you know, I mean, I'm kind of, uh, I digress a moment, is that when I was managing Evander or when I was out with Roy Jones or when I was places with LL 
Cool J or whatever the case may be. Um, we go to these events or club settings or um, <clears throat> I always made it a point to tell people like uh, the janitors or the caterers or all of those people, you know, I would go and meet them personally and talk to them for a few minutes and learn their story. And sometimes they tell me, yeah, you know, my kids love Holyfield. This and, and, and I always want to make it a point to let them know how valued they are and how important they are. And what prompted me to do that is being on the plane with our Holyfield one day going on a trip and saying that, um, and he was saying, you know, I'm looking at this guy here, you know, helping to gas up the plane. And if he's not doing his job, you know, we can't be where we are. We we can't get ready to take off to go where we're, we're looking to go. And it just, he said, it just reminds me of how important everybody is in this whole situation. You know, everybody's important. And I always tried to make that be a theme with me. Everybody is important. And I would let people know that, you know, on every level, go out of my way to try to, you know, speak to them and be with them. And and I and I know Stephen, you're probably like, well, where is that, you know, going from in regards to my question? But it just it just going back to the point of the ego, just that sometimes, you know, people would just get into you know, pushing you to a certain level, especially even in the contract negotiations. And at the end of the day, you just have to remember to remain humble that we're all people, you know, but that's not going to change how the negotiations are going to go down. You're still going to have to deal with those type of situations. But it just kind of really made me present in the moment and to understand that, um, you know, I want to sow good seeds of um, generosity and being cordial in this business. And usually if you do that, you have people circle back around in, in this business with you and people that even had hard negotiations with you that that um, it may not have always turned out the way that both parties have participated in you. They'll come back and say, you know what, I respect you because you were kind and you were nice and let's see if we can do something. And I've had that even happen. You know, I've had some situations where it just, it was all in water in the beginning with the negotiations, but they would come back and say, but you know what, but through it all, you were generous and, you know, you had a great attitude about it. And, and that's, um, and I feel like that has a lot to do with um, pushing the ball closer to the one yard line and eventually getting in the end zone. Now, <clears throat> here's Moran again, asking more <laughs> questions. Um, you were talking about uh, contract negotiations for those that you were, you were, you've been managing over the years. Now, you had to sign a contract as well uh, right. to be able to do those kinds of kinds of things. So if I had to take away um, from this uh, talk, from this particular experience, is what are uh, maybe the, the top three or top five points that you would make when it, when it comes to you signing that particular deal uh, to work with uh, that brand, uh, if you will, uh, and or uh, uh, the other side is what are those, those, it, it could very well be the same, those top three or five things that say, okay, then I'm going to sign this contract for the person that I'm managing, or I'm going to sign this contract uh, for me to work for them as a consultant. Right. Um, I, I guess number one is know, know your value. Uh, I learned early on that you can, it's very easy to get caught up. You know, when I was around some of the people I'm, I'm around and then you find yourself more in a favor mode as opposed to a work mode. You're like, okay, so you may devalue yourself and take less for what, you know, you have to put on the table and that value add that you bring to the equation um, just based on, now, you know, the superficiality of, of what's going on in the, in the entertainment space, because, you know, entertainment is a different type of beast with a different type of connotation, different type of optics. So, you know, you have to, um, you know, definitely not do that yourself. Um, number two, I, I would say in my case, you know, have, have some some principles about you that you know that you just are not going to be willing to to, to cross or compromise. Um, all money is not good money. And, and every, every deal doesn't have to get done just for the sake of getting the deal done. You know, um, 
there, there are, for, for me, I think you have to just take self inventory of uh, like what matters to you most, what feels good to your spirit. If, if, uh, and if there's something that, that has given you uh, that nourish that's just, yeah, things may be going right or maybe kind of getting close to a close, but it's just something about this that doesn't feel right. And I would always say, listen to that intuitive spirit within you. you know, my dad used to say, listen to your gut. If something's just not right, um, that may be God trying to tell you something. So it's, it's been stuff that that quasi has been lucrative that, you know, we walked away from because it just didn't feel right, you know. And uh, uh, num number three, understand that uh, negotiate on, on, on the level of trying to get the best yield that you can for your client because... The reality is that old cliche is um, you never get what you deserve, you get what you negotiate. It's, it's just actually true. You know, uh, you, you know, you you get some things and, and you may get it close to where you want it. And then there may be some some pop blessings that uh, you may get better than you deserve, you know. But the reality is that a lot of times you have uh, the lay of the land and the execution blueprint points in your head. But when you go to actually physically walk them out, in a deal structure, sometimes it doesn't necessarily equal up to how that picture looked in your head. So, <clears throat> so understand that, um, you know, put your face forward to negotiate for the highest yield that you can for your client. That's reasonable because um, a lot of times, if if the other side of the table can get more of what they want as opposed to you getting what you want, trust me, they're going to take more of what they can get. So. That's that's just the uh, philosophy and the you know uh, thematic um, the thought process I'm already saying. Yeah, I was going to ask that question because, <clears throat> or leading into that was uh, some folks get hungry just to get in the door. Right. Yeah, and I say, well, you know, I, you know, I want this. You know, I want this 50 million, you know, for my for my album, but they're saying that they may give me two million. And I say, ah, oh, that's a big drop, you know. But <laughs> <laughs> maybe if I get in the door and they see the talent that I have, and maybe yeah. they shift over. Have you seen instances where you uh where someone has uh, negotiated less than their value and then there was no change for the better, if you will? instances like that uh, unfortunately you get settled well well i have seen some like that uh, not many i've seen interesting that you say that i've seen situations where and now you know, let's talk about the value for a minute because that, that that's really really interesting in this this particular case there are situations where you can see that the landscape walking it out you know the steps going forward is going to bring you a greater outcome from an overall perspective. So therefore, the decision at the beginning may be, okay, I know what my value is and I and I and I know what I'm worth on this one, but I know that they're not going to budge on certain points. So let me take the lesser in the beginning and let me try to negotiate where, where the yield can be greater for me based on certain performance and um and um and meeting certain markers in the long run. And, um, you know, I had a situation where with Evander where they, they really didn't want to honor him on something that I knew he was worth more than. So what we did is we took a pivot and we kind of, we routed around in a way where, okay, we'll relent in a little bit in the beginning on this particular point or these particular pointers. And, but if we perform at this particular level, at this particular juncture, then we're looking to get a yield that is going to give us X. And we've done that and then we've met that market. And actually in the long run, it turned out to be a better deal had he gotten exactly what would have been quote unquote, um, his, his, his um, value point in the beginning. So um, we, we've had situations like that happen. Um, not too many Moran where I've seen, well, no, I've seen one particular thing that I can think of right now where they were so hungry for the deal that they were just like, look, yeah, but you know, you might need to wait this one out. Well, I don't want to wait. 
you know, and the impatience and the impetuous nature of it all made them enter into an agreement that really bind people. I, I saw one situation where they were um, bound to perpetuity, you know, and then, so their likeness, they're going to get a piece of uh, this person's career forever, you know, all because they were, you know, just so anxious to get the, the deal done because they were like, well, if I don't take this opportunity here, there won't be another one. And you have to always know that there's going to be more than one entrance door to the building. You know, you may have to just go around the back. You may have to look on the side. You may have to see if this window, if you can get it up, up and open. But there's going to be more than just one door to enter the building. You have to just have sometimes a little patience to, to make sure that that situation looks right, equals right, so that that um you can uh, have something that your spirit can live with in the long run. And, and another thing too is, uh, I look at it like I don't I don't profess to be the smartest person in the room, or no more than uh, everybody else. I understand that this um, um, this particular business that you know that different colors of the 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 the, the paint can go on the canvas to make the picture uh, look a certain way at any given time. So. I try not to put too much pressure on, you know, it stringently has to be, you know, this route, that route, this route. Be open to, to understand that you can be fluid and, and, and uh, that, you know, the water and the glass can take a lot of different forms and, and you can, you know, you can uh, have the opportunity to uh, not be under, under the pressure of thinking that uh, you have to um, uh, yield to, a, a certain paradigm that you know you can you can have some creative licenses to to try some things out and and and, and to me that makes it a little bit more fun in your negotiation processes because you don't put yourself um, on on this particular uh, stance of thinking that well if I don't do it exactly this way and it doesn't happen exactly that way then I, then I failed you know I just believe that you know you're going to have failures in this but. If you can approach it with an attitude of saying, oh, let me be creative, let me see exactly what different avenues we can take to get this done, it, it keeps the love for it, you know, front and center. And uh, and um, and I think that um, your ability to want to wake up the next day and continue to go forward with this remains intact. Situation, one hit wonders. Oftentimes we've seen some of those uh, and they may have signed in for a two or three album deal, but they've only had one hit. Uh, and so <clears throat> after they finished that, uh, their uh, uh, obligation uh, of that third album, that second or that third album, uh, what are they open to? They're open to leave the industry or they're open to start their own brand or even jump over, jump ship to another record label. Um, if in fact that they, um, that one hit that they have uh, now and then bringing in royalties, those royalties of course will remain under their name, but then they still or percentage of that since they were under the, the, the previous label, correct? Correct. Yeah, what opportunities do they have since uh, we, we know of many one hit wonders. Uh, that they, yeah. You know, um, the yin and yang of that is that um, you have both sides of the coin, you know, the, the, for, the, the, the heads is, is that I've seen one hit wonders that have made careers for people. Um, Chubby Checker is one name that comes to mind with the twist. I mean, he was able to parlay and finesse that into so many different opportunities, you know, whether that was uh, commercial endorsements, performances, shows, you know, um, I mean, you know, th there's a, a hit rap group, you know, um, um, uh, what is it, DJ Rob Bass and Easy Rock? I mean, they're they're touring off, they're touring off that. Um, it takes two to this day. So, you know, there there are some one hit wonders that actually have uh, made careers and kept people being able to feed their families. You know, for many many years. On the other end of that spectrum, going back to the first producer I signed with, Frederick Knight, when he wrote "Ring My Bell" for Anita Ward. 
that pretty much was the totality of what she had to offer. And then you get in frustrating situations and contracts where you may not be able to, uh, um, you know, do much more than than what that hit exhausted for you. So then you're looking for, okay, can I utilize the brand that I did build and the name that I did build from this single and the time that it was hot to kind of, you know, uh, you know, matriculate into a different uh, place in the business or maybe uh, um, get into something else that um, I enjoy and utilize maybe some of the fame from that one hit to open up more doors for me in this particular area. Um, I take a good case in point. There was a, a show that I loved in the 80s um, and early 90s called Spencer for Hire. And he um, and then the young lady on there that played Spencer's uh, love interest at the time, you know, she she didn't really get any more acting work besides that show. And she went into um, uh, you know, de decorating homes and, and uh, you know, designing furniture. And, all, and she has this successful multi-million dollar business to this day. So, you know, she was able to take uh, being on that show and, and and what she did as an actress and, and, and parlay that into a very, very uh, successful business. So a lot of that's going to depend on the individual too, Moran, and, and, and their ability to to have a um, uh, forward-thinking attitude of, okay, what can I do with this? If it's not working out for me in this particular field, because some people think that this is all I'm designed to do by God, and then they can see it crashing and burning, and they're still trying to do it. And I think that you have to have the wisdom to know exactly when to move to the left if moving the, to the right is not really you know, garnering the success that you need. The trail? Because <laughs> I'm taking over everything. Like. Well, you know, I had already asked my my first question. Um, okay. But let's let's go back to the contract. Um, mm -hmm. what are some things in a contract that you've learned throughout your um, experience that is a must? Um, you know, like some things that you just need to check for, especially in the industry in the entertainment industry, in the sporting industry, what are some mm -hmm. things that you need to just make sure that's in there so that you don't get taken advantage of or your client doesn't get taken advantage of? Just what are some some things that I, you would suggest would be a must in a contract? Two things right off the back is be very, very careful. Calm that thing through to make sure that there is nothing that is going to tie your client up in perpetuity people would try to stick that in there. So they'll try to get perpetual, you know, brand power from your client to work for them. And, um, and you will be moving on doing other things and they still have the right to, to do this, that you have to really, really, uh, really, really make sure that that's on point and not to uh, blindly get caught off guard with that. Um, and, and likeness, use of, use of likeness. Sometimes they may say, you know, um, 60 days at the end of this contract, we still have the option to utilize um, this client's likeness for the next 12 months or something, you know, to that effect. And unless there's a remuneration that's attached to it that's going to be a benefit to the client, then um, you have to make sure that they don't try to, you know, use a tactic to, to uh, continue to build on their brand and, exp and have that expansive territory to what they're doing and then you and your client have moved on and and sometimes you know you have people that have no idea that that's still happening you know with their clients so uh, un unfortunately we live in a world that, that people will try to get as much as they can out of you um that will benefit them you know it's it's never ever to the benefit of you uh, never ever was maybe too strong of a phrase to say a lot of times they want to make it to where it benefits them exclusively and and benefits you for the time that you're being utilized for whatever said, you know, purpose of that country. But though, those are two things. And the reason I can speak to those is that, um, you know, I've had some mishaps where uh, a, a, a perpetuity, perpetual situation kind of slipped past me once. 
And um, I had to go back and sit down with the with the owner of this company, with this client, and and uh, put on my humble hat and and and, um, and try to say, hey, you know, man, let me let me take you to dinner. And what steak on the menu do you want? Let's talk about this contract. You know, th- it wasn't really structured to go this particular. And thank God that in my case, I was able to get that rectified, and they released them from that perpetual situation. But usually, that can be a monster if um, that happens, and you can't. Uh, get out of it. I mean, it, it can ruin relationships. It just, it's a very, very dangerous thing. And, and, and so, you know, when you have a lot on your plate and have a good time, if it's not the right type of people in, in place, things like that can kind of slip past you. And that can, uh, that can be unfortunately the death nail in the coffin. So how uh, talking about use of likeness, like for example, if we, uh, and I'm just trying to make sure kind of what I think would be different uh, if you would agree to where if, for example, for uh, advertising, you speaking, we had gotten your headshot and put it on our website and said, oh, here, you know, here's Chester, you speaking and all that. And then that got moved to an archived article to where it still show here, here's all the past things we've done this year. And it still has your picture and information. Is, are you thinking more along the lines that's okay versus this was somebody using the person's likeness for an ad campaign or or something different? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Absolutely. 100%. I, mean, I just know um, in our experience, a, a lot of what many of us would deal with, well, when you're using somebody's likeness, it's going to be advertising, here's this event and might have the headshot or that sort of thing. Um and of course, if we did any like clips uh, that we wanted to use as advertising of video clips and that sort of thing, that of course, I, I firmly agree would need to be included in any contract and all that because you want that, that the right to do that. So, okay. Yeah, I agree with you totally on that. I mean, you know, that from, from an archive perspective, I mean, that's there. I was a part of this with you all today. You know, that th- those are facts. Nothing's going to change that. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, you're just showing the discography of what you've done, who you have. Um, I, I think that all of that is a uh, fair game and, uh, you know, you're not trying to uh, make a monetary yield off, uh, you, you know, th- that is all the difference in, uh, in the way that that's approached. So I agree with you. Well, Dr. Moran, we've got to cancel our ad yeah. campaign where we were going to say he's at that he uh, stands behind <laughs> the chapter. <laughs> <laughs> in your in your case, it's totally fine because you know Dr. James Moran can get whatever he needs from me. <laughs> so that's, that's very kind, Dr. Gabrielli. Yes, I'm so sorry I got called away there. That was an important mm-hmm. call I had to take, but wow. yeah, uh, it, it's. I look forward to listening to the part that I missed. Um, in the end here, can you just tell me what's the one thing you're most proud of, Mr. Johnson, the one thing you're most proud of through your career so far? The I think the number one thing that I'm most proud of out of all of this, and, and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant or egotistical, is um, just my character and my integrity. I think that if you go back and you, and you talk to um, the people I know in this business, people I've dealt with, They'll always tell you that I've been fair and I've always tried to be kind. You know, I, I really don't think, you know, and I, and I know that that is, um, you know, the, it, it, when we look in the mirror, we see actually the f- reflection that we want to see as opposed to what everybody else may see. But with that being said, I really don't think that um, th- there's been an incident that I've had where um, I've walked away from a relationship that's been negative or, 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 I, ha- or I had a situation where, um, People were just saying, um, you know, Chester did this to me. And we weren't able, you know, and I had to watch him because he took that from, you know, I've, I've always tried to leave every situation harmonious and uh, and um, and cordial across. So I, I think, you know, reputation and integrity is everything to me because your name and your character is all that you have, you know, at the end of the day. So I've always tried to make sure that I do everything that I can to keep that intact. And if I feel like I've done something that may have um, adversely affected someone, I try to go back and make sure that that's taken care of. But that, that's always been very important to me. It's how people, you know, my, my dad used to say from the pe- pulpit, people may not always remember everything that you do, but they'll remember how you make them feel. 
So I try to make sure that, you know, people have a good experience with me if possible. Everything is not going to be perfect, you know, in our, in our humanity, they're going to be, you know, some things are just not going to work out the way we want them to, you know, that's just life. But um, I try to really, really live by treating others the way I want to be treated. And, um, and um, hopefully I've done that. Thank you. Well, it's been really outstanding listening to you and your experiences. Mm-hmm. And I just thank you for being here and sharing your time with us. Oh, the place. Oh, and your my. expertise. Any, anything I can do for you guys at any time, you know, um, Dr. James Moran knows I'm a phone call away. And, you know, and um, I'm, I'm looking actually right now with my family, we're looking to make our home there within the next year or two. So I'm looking to come back to Tallahassee for oh. good my last stop and um but um he he has the access to me and anything that he needs is nothing that I wouldn't do for him so you know I'm 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 honored and it was a pleasure to meet you all today and to be here with you. The pleasure's all ours. Thank you. Thank I mean you. it's we, we really learned I know I learned a lot because it's a different perspective. We're on the whole other side of things and um you know it's interesting to hear that perspective very candidly. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. And thank you so very much for, for being with us. And uh, we know that your schedule was extremely busy, but uh, we appreciate you carving this, this time out to, uh, to spend with us. And wow, an hour and a half has really gone by fairly quickly. It didn't feel like it was <laughs> interesting, extremely wonderful, and, uh, a wonderful conversation. Uh, and uh, I will yield to the president. Is there anything else, sir, that uh, you'd well, like to share before we sign out? Well, first, Latrell, were you trying to say something? I saw the box light up. Well, um, since he had said that if there was anything we needed, you know, I'd love to break into show business. You know, I could use <laughs> manager, Chester. Uh, <laughs> secondly, <laughs> well, secondly well, Steven, my phone is about to die. And I just wanted to make sure on the survey that you mentioned, did you send me an email on that, or is it something I need to go on the website for? It was it's on, the, it's it was on a, both places, yeah. email and the website. Okay, awesome. And, and social media. All right. Well, thank you uh, again, Chester. Thanks, everybody. Uh, Y'all have a wonderful evening. Uh, James and Gabrielle, I'll be sending you an email to try to connect soon, uh, maybe sometime next week, as I'm about to be out of town the rest of this week. So, Sounds all right. good. Thank you. Thanks again. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Bye. 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 God bless. Bye. Bye. God bless you too. Bye. 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 B